check. Wait, did you do part of it? We did, but um, it's not really. We had technical difficulties in period one. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at a few of these. Okay, I'm getting very worried in the back that you're not going to shut up eventually. Okay, we're taking a look at number one. Okay, we have a significance test has a p-value of 0 0.04. For what values can we reject our null hypothesis? Okay, well, remember you reject if the p-value is less than alpha. And so in other words, if you have any alpha greater than 0 0.04, you would reject your null <laughs> hypothesis. Okay. What values would that be? 0 0.04, 1 in the um, Alpha, well, standard one would be 0.05. Wait, standard one? A standard alpha level. Oh, 5%. Those two, definitely, but you're right. Um, an alpha level of 4.1, technically, you would reject, although I don't know why you would have an alpha level of 4.1%. Right. Number two, a significant test allows you to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative at the 5% significance level. Can you reject that null hypothesis at the 10% level? Can you reject it at the 1% level? So I have written here that you will reject if the p-value, well, since we're rejecting that, all we know is that the p-value is less than 0 0.05. Okay, so the question is, if it's below 0 0.05, is it also below 0 0.1? The answer is yes. Okay, since 0 0.1 is greater than 0 0.05, and 0 0.05 is in turn greater than the p-value, that means that the p-value is less than 0 0.1. Now, Ms. Bates would like to talk to Tanya about this. Is it serious? It's about graduation. It's she serious. texted me, I don't know. Okay. That's all she told me. Okay. However, at the one percent level, we know that point zero five is less than the p value is greater than our p value. But we don't know if this is true, point if the p value is between point one and point five point zero five. Or if the p-value is actually less than 0 0.01. We just don't know. We don't have that information. So since we don't know, we can't reject at the 1% level. The p-value may or may not be less than 0 0.01. Questions on that? Yeah? So you can just say we can't reject it? Yeah. Okay. Or we don't have the evidence to reject. So you can't say we don't. We may reject it. We just don't know. Question three. <coughs> we have a significance test. Uh, mu equals 100 against mu is not equal to 100. A sample size of 80 produces a test statistic z equals 0.8. OK. And what is the p-value of that test statistic? OK. Well, it's the z-curve. So for question three, the p-value is going to be the value of this tail plus the value of this tail here. Why two tails? Because our, null, our alternative hypothesis is not equal to right here. This tells us two tails. So since we have a two-tail test, the p-value is going to be, well, there's a couple ways you could write this. The p-value is equal to the probability that z is less than negative 0.8 or greater than 0.8, which is the same thing as saying 2 times the probability that z is greater than 0.8. That probability is 0.4237 from the calculator. Let's review that really quickly. How do we get 4237? 2 times the probability that we're going from 0.8 to 1e99.
I learned that you don't have to put the one, you can just put E99. That'll save you one keystroke. You never know. So that's where that 4237 comes from. Okay. Next question, question four. The critical value, what is a critical value that satisfies the condition that the t-distribution with eight degrees of freedom has a probability of 0.1 on the right? Well, let's draw that. Here's a probability of 0.1 to the right. This is for you. This is for you. You're a great man, Mr. Furrier. I hope you guys win your bracket. Mm, yeah, me too. The period three, you know who's doing the best right now is period four and five. Really? Yeah. The calculate the calculus calculators are doing better than the stats count. You know who's in dead last? Period one. <laughs> Nothing surprising. <laughs> you know who's in next to last place? That. I'm just gonna say that. Me. Next to last place. No. Um, okay. So how do we get this one point three nine seven? Remember that the area to the the area to the left is 0.9. And so to get a T score, you need an inverse T. So we're looking for inverse T. The area on the left is 0.9. There are eight degrees of freedom. And that gives me the 1.397. 1.397. And that's where that comes from. Questions? Let's look at five. We wish to test if a new feed increases mean weight compared to the old feed. I think they're talking about barnyard animals here. At the conclusion of the experiment, it was found that the new feed gave a 10 kilogram gain, bigger gain than the old feed. A two sample t test with a proper one sided alternative was done, and the resulting p value was 0 0.082. Interpret this p value in context. Okay. Now, they didn't give you an alpha. Right? So, uh, what alpha do we use? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but I'm kind of jumping the gun because we're supposed to interpret the p value. So, the p value <coughs> is the following number five. If the null hypothesis was true, which would be the old feed, the new feed, and the old feed uh, produce the same weight gain. then the probability that a sample, do we have a sample size? No. Okay. That it, then a sample would produce a weight gain <coughs> at least as um, extreme as our test statistic or as our X bar is looks like 8.2 percent. We always have to write out the words null hypothesis. Can we just put H naught? You can put H naught. 
So if a, our null hypothesis was true, then the probability that we would get our sample or a sample more extreme than our sample would be 8.2%. And I think that's all they wanted, just to interpret that p-value. Is that rare or is that not rare? Wait, interpreting the p-value? No, is 8.2% rare or not rare? Is that likely to happen or not likely to happen? Not, likely. Yeah, not, not terribly likely. Okay. Let's take a look at question. The next one we did was free response question two. Is everyone finished with that number five? Let's look at qu free response question two. I have this work done for us already. Notice we've signaled that this is a percent of patients reporting. So that 9 is 9%. That 8.1 is 8.1%. <coughs> that should tell you P. Okay, so calculate a 99% confidence interval for the percentage of patients using Seldane that report drowsiness. You don't need to panic. What do they want? I was going to say about graduation. Was it really about graduation? Yeah, I was writing a letter to the top of one that I just wants me to send it to Oh, okay. Not about your personal graduation. Oh, no, no, no. It's that sounded more dire than... Yeah, I don't know. She sounds like it was urgent. Yeah, like you were, they were going to flunk you out of Taft. <laughs> <laughs> Keep you for a fifth year, a fifth year senior. Nope. Super senior. Oh, God, no. <laughs> That was awesome. That's the appropriate reaction. <laughs> okay, so what do we need to do? We need to con make our confidence interval P is equal to P hat plus or minus Z star 99, PQ over N. Does this, do these familiars look familiar? Do these formulas look familiar? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay, this should. This is chapter 10, right? Okay, uh, P hat is 0.9. Everyone see where P hat came from? Q hat is 91%, N is 781, and how do we get that Z star? Let's do our calculator. This is an inverse norm. Or you have to go there. Yeah. Um, in the answers, why don't you solve for X? Uh, this question? Yeah. Like, yeah. I'll look for that. Let me look for that in a minute. Yeah. We want an interval. Uh, we want 99% confidence, so that spits out 2.576. So that's where that T star comes, that Z star comes from. 2.576, all the numbers are now in place. Calculate, notice we're calculating that with the margin of error. And then we're writing that as an interval. A little interpretation never hurt anyone. We're 99% confident that the proportion of people who will get drowsy using Seldane is between 6.4 and 11.6%. Okay. That's not that many people, right? Wait, margin of error is just the Z star times that. Yes. Thing we're Z star times the um, standard error. Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> part B. Based on the confidence interval and the percentage of placebo patients <laughs> who report drowsiness, what conclusions can be drawn? Well, the placebo produced an 8.1% drowsiness. In other words, if you're not taking any medication, then 8.1% of the people not taking any medication report drowsiness. 8.1% is in the confidence interval. That's always what you want to look for. Is the other number inside our confidence interval? And it is. So that means that we can't say for sure that the people taking Seldane are less drowsy than the people not taking Seldane. Wait, if it was outside the confidence interval, would you be sure then? Hmm? If it was outside the confidence interval. If it was outside the confidence interval, then... You would be sure. Yeah. 
Okay. So we can't say that the people taking Seldane are less drowsy than the people taking anything else. Nor can we say that they are more drowsy, right? Yeah. That's another interesting one. Also, we cannot conclude that taking Seldane will make people more drowsy. I think that's probably the, the more important thing here. If you're taking Seldane, then you're just as drowsy as people who are not taking anything. That sounds, that's, that's the more important conclusion, isn't it? <clears throat> Seldane is not going to make you more drowsy than if you had taken nothing at all. Yeah, in other words, it's not making you drowsier than normal. Right? Okay, and I think that's where we're going to stop today. Okay, so that's, we've done five, we've done six of 16. We have a review Monday after school, right? Six of 14, that's pretty good. Yeah, Monday after school. Okay.